flows from it has been deeply compromised. Um, and all one has to do in the world is utter the words Abu Huraib or, or Guantanamo Bay or torture or waterboarding, detention without trial, and all the wretched things that flowed under that headline to know how much American values have been compromised and the election of the new president does represent that change even though he's running into his own problems on that front. But the broader point remains that not only was the war a failure uh, on the front uh, of dealing with terrorism, but also that it dealt a grievous blow to the American ideal and American values and American constitution, and by extension, Western European and Canadian values as well. The fourth point to be made is that Canada has not been immune from post-9-11 excesses. Some of us, you know, we always, the great definition of a Canadian is a Canadian is one who is not American. Um, and we always take great pride in, in saying uh, that happens in the United States. We don't have to worry about it, but we do because even though we have not made as grievous as us as the Americans, we have not been immune from some of the excesses. And all one has to say is tick off headlines, you know, Meher the 2003 trial, not trial, the charting of the 23 Pakistani and, and, and Indian students in Toronto who are supposed to be blowing up the CN Tower and the Pickering nuclear plant on and on, and not a single charge of terrorism or anything vaguely related to it was proceeded with, and they were either deported or left uh, of their own volition. Uh, we also know, we have heard the word security certificates, which are found to be ultraviolet of the Constitution by, uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada. We have also heard of three other Arab Canadians who were also allegedly tortured in Syria, like Maharar. And a justice uh, of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Frank Yacobucci, uh, did find that they were indeed tortured. Uh, and they are yet to be compensated like Maharar was. Uh, the last point to be made is really that even though we have gone through these excesses, Canada being Canada, Canada was the only nation in the Western world to have established a full-fledged royal commission to look into the wrong done to Maharar. So Justice O'Connor, who is only four blocks from here, brought his famous report which led to the official apology to Maharar and $10 million. This is the only country which also um, appointed, as I said, Justice Yakabuchi. So we have this inclination in Canada to learn from our mistakes more quickly than other nations in the world. So we ought to be uh, as concerned as we have been about the issues in Canada. We ought to recognize uh, the, that we have been much quicker in, in righting the wrongs, not more than the last 15 or 16 years, to understand why the world is topsy-turvy in most of the lands where Muslims live. Uh, the 1991 uh, Saddam Hussein invasion of Kuwait, again a geopolitical issue and nothing to do with religion, which was then followed by debilitating American-led economic sanctions from 1993 to 2003. And according to the United Nations, um, a million people died slow death in those 10 years of time. 500,000 of whom, according to UNICEF, were children, um, and died of lack of food, lack of mal malnut uh, because of malnutrition, lack of health care, and so on. Million innocent Iraqis dead under American-led economic sanctions. In Chechnya's two wars, at least 200,000 Muslims were killed. Bosnia and Kosovo, in the heart of Europe, we know what happened. Our general estimates are that 250,000 people died. Then since then, in the name of fighting terrorism, there has been the Iraq War, which as we know has led to tens of thousands of civilians dying. And according to various studies, the number of civilians dead in Iraq is, runs between 86,000. And all you have to do is go on WW Iraq body count and you will see this number and they update it every day or according to the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, um, at least one million people have died in Iraq since the American invasion. So the equation is clear. 19 terrorists killed 3,000 innocent civilians in the United States on 9-11, and since then at least 100,000 Iraqi civilians are dead, dead. 
and we don't even count how many have died. We are so racist that we don't count the civil casualties. These are estimates done by various organizations in two neighboring nations. 1.2 million in Syria, 800,000 in Jordan. Another 2 million have been internally displaced in Iraq. So it's 4 million people displaced in Iraq since 2003. A similar but smaller story in Afghanistan, we do not know how many civilians have been killed because we don't even bother to count. We have stories about either drones or American bombing killing 50 people here, 100 people there. Um, at least, according to one estimate, 30,000 civilians have been killed, not all of them by the NATO and Allied forces, also by the Taliban, but at least half of them or a third of them, depending on which count you follow, civilians have been killed by the people who have gone ostensibly to put things right in Afghanistan. If you add up this total, you will find that at least between 1.2 and 1.4 million Muslims have been killed in the last 16 or 17 years. Why are we surprised that the Muslim world is in total turmoil, literally and figuratively? We don't have to look for religious reasons and Islamic reasons for it. And when people have to fight for foreign forces in their lands and then when they're being killed, and the oppressed always turn to whatever comes in handy to rally the public. And most scholars have now come around to the viewpoint that Islam and the Islamic flag, in whatever form, in distorted form or the right form, is a rallying cry for Muslims, for the oppressed to gather under and fight this battle. As simple as that. If proportionately, for example, 100,000 or 250,000 or God forbid 500,000 Canadians have been killed, what would be our reaction? What would we be saying? I mean, it's not so surprising that all this is happening. Every explanation in the book, except this explanation. Oh, this is Islam, this is Jihad, this is part of the totalitarianism of Muslims, Muslims are crazy, Muslims are fundamentalists. On and on it goes. Except the most obvious point, which I have just made, uh, and it doesn't take a genius to sort of figure these two out. But we don't want to know. We are in a state of denial, or we are being kept in a state of denial by officially led propaganda and spin uh, that goes on these days. All of it brings me back to the first point, which is that laying of this collective guilt on all Muslims is the most counterproductive, hypocritical and dishonest exercise that we have had since 9-11. That is the central point and central hypothesis of the book that I have done, is uh, how many times uh, have you stopped Muslims or Muslims have been stopped and say, what do you have to say about Besla? So I am personally responsible for Besla, you know. Uh, and I can just predict when I'm going to the office on a day when some horrendous thing happened somewhere, what my inbox will say. It will say exactly what I said. Mr. Siddiqui, what do you have to say about this? You know, I have to say nothing more than any civilized person has to say. But this laying of collective guilt is a gimmick, is a trick that deliberately conflicts all the people uh, who, who call themselves Muslims with the actions of the few. It's like saying that the Serb Canadians in Mississauga were responsible for Kosovo or for Bosnia and so on and so forth. We don't do that because we learned our lesson from the Second World War when we interned Japanese Canadians, yet we have a different standards when it comes to Muslims and Islam that we continue to do this. And I always quote Anne Frank, uh, this Jewish girl who was hiding from the Nazis in an attic in Amsterdam and she wrote a famous diary and everyone should read it. Um, and it says this famous line, when a Christian does something wrong, it is the fault of that individual Christian. When a Jew does something wrong, it is the fault of all Jews. We are inflicting this equation on Muslims today as though we have never learned anything from our history. Um, and if we think this belongs only in the United States or someplace else, it is very much part of the public discourse and public narrative and it poisons public policy and public debate in Canada, as we have seen in the issue of so-called Sharia debate in Ontario, which had nothing to do with Sharia whatsoever. No Sharia can possibly ever come to Canada. If I advocated in Canada that hands of thieves be chopped off, I would go to jail. As simple as that, you know. So no Sharia could possibly have come, but it was called a Sharia debate. It was called a Sharia debate by some of the organizers mistakenly and in their enthusiasm, and it was gleefully 
reflected by the, all those uh, who did not like Muslims. So it was a Sharia was coming to Canada and we got no Sharia was coming. All it was that since 1991 Arbitration Act in Ontario, Jews and Christians had been there. family based, religious based arbitration. Issue simply was if they are doing it, can Muslims do it? And it could not credibly be argued that Muslims are more vicious than other people when it comes to religious arbitration. So that left the government only with the choice of either abolishing it for everyone, which is fine, or doing it for everyone. And the government opted for abolishing it for everyone, so it came to the right decision for all the wrong reasons. So we end up with a polluted debate and all this sort of hyperventilating for 13, 14 months and then we get to that the losers were the poor Christians and, and Jews who were already doing it and they lost it. So the victims are never really Muslims in the end. It, in a democracy, it ends up affecting others. These articles, human rights commissions are censorious, they are uh, oppressive and so on and so forth. Not a people heard about the human rights commission until Muslims went to use the human rights commission. Uh, and we are again sort of full of hypocrisy and full of contradiction. And we also had this debate in Quebec during the so-called reasonable accommodation debate, which was anything but reasonable. And I highly recommend uh, everyone to read the Bouchard Taylor Commission report, the, which is huge. Just read the executive summary, uh, and they in, in effect say basically what I've been saying here. Uh, the final point to remember uh, that in we live, of, uh, of course, in, a, in the most multicultural country in the world. <coughs> the United States is said to be a great nation of immigrants, but in the United States, only one in ten Americans is an immigrant. In Canada, one in five is an immigrant, and in this blessed city of ours, nearly one out of two people is foreign-born, and 45% of them are uh, visible minorities. In Canada, as in the United States, and as in Europe, Islam is the fastest growing religion. And this is not said to scare people, but just a statement of fact. In Canada, the latest estimate is that we have 750,000 Muslims in this country. And the perception that most of them are Arabs is wrong. Uh, in fact, most of them are, majority of them are from South Asia, either Indians or Pakistanis, and Sri Lankans, and so on and Bangladeshis. In fact, another misconception about the Arab population of Canada is they think, they assume that all Arabs uh, are Muslims. In fact, half of the Arab Canadian population is Christian. The last three presidents of the Canadian Arab Federation, in fact, have been Christian. So this is, it behooves us to know who our neighbors are uh, and where do they come from and what all do we need to know about them. Uh, and it, of the 750,000, another survey has shown that A, they are the youngest ethnic group in Canada. The average Canadian age is 37.2 years and the average Muslim age is 28. So you know um, this is a younger population and they will be very much continue to be a great part of Canada. Um, and the second piece of uh, survey was done that showed that Muslim Canadians are disproportionately more educated than the average Canadian. They have more university degrees and post-secondary education. Yet, they are underemployed and unemployed, and that's a separate issue. But that is the demographic profile of Muslims. So it behooves us as citizens of Canada, we, be Muslim or non-Muslim, that we get to know each other and critically examine the public discourse that we hear every day. Thank you very much.